Hello, and welcome to this special Halloween episode of Such a Nightmare, Conversations About Horror. My name is Katherine Troyer, and this is Anthony Tresca. Hello there. This is a podcast devoted to thoughtful discussions about that fine line between the horrific and the horrible. Each episode looks at a specific horror text that is, for better or worse, giving us nightmares. And we are excited and so very, very thankful to have you join us for our special halloween episode about Halloween. Yay! Not about Halloween the holiday. We're not doing a history lesson about that. No. No, we're, we're going to be talking about the 1978 film, Halloween. Yes, and it's good that you say the date, because of course there are lots of Halloween films, yes. which means that we have plenty of future Halloween episodes yes. on Halloween Stay films. tuned for the foreseeable future where we'll release a new Halloween-themed episode about a Halloween property until we die or they run out of money to keep making Halloween movies. Yay! Woo! So one of the things that we have heard from some of our fans, thank you for reaching out to us. Thank you, fans. Is that we could occasionally engage in more disagreement with each other, civil disagreement, of course, and that that would be entertaining and engaging to see that Anthony and I are not only almost always in disagreement Mm -hmm. with the wide universe, but also sometimes that we're in disagreement with each other. And so naturally, we've decided to end this podcast and start a fight club. Yay! Oh, that was so exciting. (laughs) But see, you've already broken the first rule. Because you've told them all about it. Well, I assume everyone who listens to this podcast is going to be a part of the fight club. Okay, excellent. Yay for new activity. Um, (laughs) In the meantime, as we finish, like, you know, securing a location for our underground fight club, Mm -hmm. we thought that we would talk about Halloween in part because it's just kind of a perfect choice for a Halloween episode, but also because, unfortunately, dear listeners, Anthony does not love this film as much as he probably should. I know it's a classic, but just because it's a classic does not mean I have to enjoy it. I definitely agree with that. I mean more that you should enjoy it because I want you to enjoy it. So, Alas, if the movie was better, I could <gasps> enjoy it. Sadness. So even though this is a special Halloween episode and we're going to clearly be at slight odds with one another, we're going to still start the, the usual way um, by having a critical framework that I'll provide and then Anthony will, as usual, provide an excellent sort of background to the film and give us some information and quotes and things like that. We should always start in facts before we descend into nonsense. Yes, that's the motto of our episode. Uh-huh. And my life. <laughs> That's both really sad and funny. And I don't know what to say beyond that. So I'm just going to transition into saying that one of the things I really like about Halloween is that it exemplifies what Bernice M. Murphy calls the suburban gothic. And this isn't something that is unique to American horror, but I think that it is something that culturally speaking really resonates with fears and tensions that we have this idea of the suburban space and starting possibly with psycho in the 1960s but certainly by the time we get to the 1970s i think that the suburban gothic becomes at the forefront of a lot of our american horror in texts like halloween and so murphy discusses the idea that we have both the traditional gothic which is like old castles and you know on the moors and all that inherently like victorian yes inherently victorian and romantic and it's like again you know you're like of course something tragic and scary happens here because look at this place look at the murder house it's really exactly it seems like a perfect place for a murder yeah exactly and and of course you know there have been lots of people that have played off of that and then lots of like spoofs of that But even if you look back at what is often considered the first American Gothic novel, which came out in 1798, and it's Charles Brockton Brown's Wieland, even then you can begin to see the roots of moving away from the castles and the estates, because that's not something that was as much a part of the American life as it was the European life, and moving more towards familiar places, the home that was recognizable to the American audience. And then eventually that became the suburban home because suburbia was 
what was recognizable. And the fears and tensions that are emerging are all centered on this idea of the suburban dream. So if we go back to like the 1950s when having the the house in the suburbs with the white picket fence was the American dream, it was synonymous with what it meant to be American and what it meant to be successful, it's not unsurprising that quickly people were like, but isn't it also a little terrifying? Mm -hmm. What if we look under this? What's happening here? Exactly. And so in the suburban Gothic, uh, and Murphy, I'm pulling this from Murphy's sort of introduction to her chapter, which is like, welcome to to Disturbia, right? Mm. Um, She talks about the fact that in the suburban Gothic, one is almost always in more danger from the people in the house next door or one's own family than from external threats. Horror here invariably begins at home or at least very near to it. And in that sense, the subgenre continues the uneasy fascination with the connection between living environment and psychology, which helped reinvigorate the haunted house story in the mid 20th century. And she says that if there's the suburban dream, right, the chance to have your own home, the chance to have nice neighbors, this utopian setting, etc., there is very clearly a suburban nightmare. Um, and it's haunted, and there's debt and financial entanglement, <laughs> and there's neighbors that offer something really terrible to, and have things that they're hiding. And the home is a place of entrapment and unhappiness, and it feels very claustrophobic, and there's going to be spaces in the home that feel like places that you can easily be trapped and so it ends with this idea that the place in which the most dangerous threats come from within not from without there's a phone call coming from inside the house 100 percent. and i think that halloween is a perfect film for exploring these ideas of the fact that maybe what we should be most afraid of is not I mean, yes, it's it's a masked killer, right? But it's also like... Oh, was that what we were supposed to be afraid of? <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe we're supposed to be afraid of, you know, things like teen sexuality. Cause I was so afraid scary. of the pacing issues. Oh, no. Sadness. <laughs> um, but, but also, there is this idea that, like, there's something really scary about the fact that the parents don't really seem to be involved. Um, no one seems to be noticing that all this really bad stuff is happening because on the outside, the yard is nice and mm-hmm. the house is nicely decorated, so nothing bad could be happening Can't inside. disrupt the trick-or-treating. Exactly. And so I think th- I, that's one of the reasons why I love this film. Is I just feel like it's a perfect example of this idea that we should be most scared of that which seems most safe and traditional. Well, uh, the film certainly is a staple of the genre, whether or not I agree with its quality. Uh, So this film was a, as I alluded to at the top, a 1978 American slasher film that was both directed and scored by John Carpenter. It was co-written with producer producer Deborah Hill and starred Donald Pleasance and Jamie Lee Curtis in her feature film debut. So that's pretty good for her. I mean, if nothing else, you have to at least like the film for giving us Jamie Lee Curtis. I mean, American treasure Jamie Lee Curtis. She really makes me happy, like, every time I see her. So at least the film gave us that. It eventually led to the Ryan Murphy's Scream Queens with Jamie Lee Curtis. So, yes. like, I can't be too upset because without this we wouldn't have gotten that so. see indeed all right so a little bit about john carpenter john carpenter was always interested in film from a very early age uh he really liked westerns as well as 1950s low budget horror and high budget sci-fi films he was very specific he likes his horror low budget and his science fiction high that's funny uh, he began filming horror short films with 8mm film even before he entered high school, actually. Uh, his first film that was feature film, he actually released a short film that got nominated for an Academy Award before this, but his first big film was called Dark Star in 1974. It was a science fiction comedy he co-wrote with Dan O'Bannon, who later went on to write Alien and took a lot of the elements from this Uh, in that film and just revamped them and used them again in Alien. And on that film was really where he learned how to multitask as a filmmaker. He did so many different elements along with Dan O'Bannon and just like he helped write the score for that one as well. He did a lot of like the on stage, on the, he did a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, the making of props, the getting everything, coordinating. He did it all with this, with this partner there. And after that, he made some other smaller films, but Halloween was really his first commercial success. Before this, nobody really cared who John Carpenter was. Except for 
film producers. There was a couple film producers who actually sought out Carpenter to direct a film for them about a psychotic killer that stalked babysitters. <laughs> uh, one of the producers said, I was thinking about what would make sense in the horror genre, and what I wanted to do was make a picture that had the same impact as The Exorcist. So... I think in that respect, he was successful, right? When you think about, like, what are the films that shaped today's modern horror f directors, um, and what are the films that, like, horror fans cite again and again as the ones that sort of affected them the most, Halloween is going to be in that list with The Exorcist. Yet another film that I also don't enjoy that much. Yeah, so brace yourself. Neither one of us liked The Exorcist, and eventually we will talk about it and hopefully you'll still be listening at that point and this phrase hasn't, like, ended all of your willingness <laughs> Yeah, hopefully willingness you have listen. not just turned this off because it's blasphemous and yes. gotten your holy water and thrown it at your podcast listening device. Yes, we promise we'll get into that later, but yes. And another film that Anthony really doesn't like. And mm -mm. So this film was originally titled The Babysitter Murderers, but... Oh, gross. Yeah, I mean... It's like a play on, like, the Babysitter's Club, I suppose. Was <laughs> well, this before or after the Babysitter's Club? It would have been before, I believe. Wow. Yeah. But it's still gross. <laughs> like, it's, it's gross. just, it's not a good title. Uh, but one of the producers suggested setting the movie on Halloween night and naming it Halloween instead. Probably the move. Yes. Uh, so Carpenter said of the concept, Halloween night. It's never been the theme of the film. My idea was always to do an old haunted house film. So it wasn't really about the holo the holiday of Halloween. It was more just about making a good old bloody romp of a haunted house yeah, film. Yeah, again, it goes back to that idea of the suburban gothic. Yeah. Uh, so it took about 10 days to write the script. Uh, one of the producers wanted the script to be written by, like, a radio show with booze every 10 minutes. Mm. So, yeah. I don't think they succeed. No. But that's a interesting way to think about writing a movie as yeah. if it was a radio show. Yeah, that is really interesting. Um, maybe not possible, but definitely an intriguing sort of thought experiment. Also, very interesting because so much of this movie relies on silence and just, like, you it's seeing. True. So, Which is not something you can do no. with a radio show. <laughs> not in the least. So this film only had a $300,000 budget, which even at this time when they were making it was not a lot of money and so because of how low budget this film the wardrobe and props were often crafted from items that they just like found or they could buy inexpensively like i mean one of the really famous examples is the mike myers mask itself they just bought it from like a store it was a captain kirk mask that they bought for a dollar 98 wow from a costume shop on hollywood boulevard and they just, like, widened the eyes and spray-painted the flesh that white, bluish, weird, freaky mm -hmm. color. And so that's how you got that mask. It And it's so funny because now, like, you can buy that mask not for a dollar or something, right? Like, But it just it's interesting to, to have there be something so iconic that has its roots in yeah. another iconic thing. Like, that, that's really interesting. I, I think it was a, probably a, a good move to spray-paint it so yes. that... You weren't just being, like, stalked by Captain Kirk. Although, you know, that might also be scary. Also interesting. But yes. I think spray painting it also the move. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So, like, many of the actors just, like, showed up and wore their own clothes. Uh, I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis's wardrobe was actually purchased at JCPenney's for $100. Ooh. There you go. Fancy. She went out, had a budget, she got herself some fancy little clothes, came on film. Uh, so it was shot in 20 days over a four-week period in May of 1978, and uh, it was pretty low-key in terms of direction. Like, Carpenter would just be like, here is my feel for the scene, here is how scared you should be on a numerical scale of 1 to 10, and so he'd be like, all right, Curtis, you're supposed to be a 6 here. All right, this scene's a full-out 10, just go for it. And as little direction as he gave to the actors playing the teenage characters and whatnot, he gave even less direction to the person who was Michael Myers. Uh, for example, when they asked like him about 
what's my motivation for this scene? Carpenter told him that his motivation was to walk from one set marker to another and not act. <laughs> That's interesting. So I do have to say, one of the things I like about the sort of like origin story of this film is that I think sometimes we get sort of hung up on the idea that there needs to be a big budget, that there needs to be, you know, a lot of big name stars, a lot of attention, a lot of, you know, entire constructions of set designs and things like that. And that I think this film illustrates that that's not necessarily what's going to capture or hook people, that it's really something else that engages us at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, they, made a movie on this budget and they did and one that has done them very well exactly i mean uh it was released on october 25th 1978 and while it wasn't an immediate success uh it performed really well with very little advertising relying on word of mouth but many critics at the time seemed pretty uninterested or very dismissive of the film However, it still grossed $70 million internationally and is one of the most successful independent films of all time. Wow. So it took that minuscule budget and made $70 million off of it. And it has spawned seven sequels, a 2007 remake with the 2009 sequel to the 2007 remake, an 11th installment in 2018. Two more sequels have been announced to that installment uh, that are slated to be released October 16th, 2020, and October 15th, 2021. It's held as one of the greatest uh, horror films of all time, and honestly, a lot of people even say it's one of the best films of all time, not removing any type of genre classifications for labeling it as so great. So, given all of that, I should like it, right? You should. I. You really should. That's just kind of like where the sentence ends. Because I feel as though this film does so many things so right. And because of that, it really does deserve to be one that we are constantly talking about. And then we are constantly talking about in a positive, sort of like groundbreaking sort of way. But I realize that you have a problem with it. And it's actually a problem that I have with it as well. It's just one that I'm willing to forgive. So would you articulate your like big issue and then we'll use that as our framework to like weave in and out of the good things and the, the problematic things of this film? So this film goes back to a theory uh, about horror uh, that it can either be conservative horror and we're not talking politically right. here. It can either be conservative in terms of it is affirming the status quo. And sometimes to, I think, help distinguish between like conservative, the political, and conservative, the move, I think sometimes the horror is described as affirmative, right? Mm -hmm. It is ultimately affirming the fact that at the end of the day, we're good people, and there may be this evil that is going to, you know, encroach upon our world. But and good our neighborhood. And our neighborhood and our home. But at the end of the day, good people will triumph, and there's enough of those around um, in the existing world that we're okay. And so the opposite of that would be disaffirmative. Very helpful, the label there. Um, and that says everything is bad, everything is terrible. That we are the we, problem. We are the problem, nothing we do can stop it because we deserve this. And so we're peeling back the curtain, we're peeling back the sheet on, on ourselves, and mm -hmm. we're seeing that we are the the root of, of the brokenness. So this film is not disaffirmative. No. It is so affirmative, conservative, and how it upholds this status quo. And I think it is, that is not necessarily a problem. I mean, Happy Death Day is a film that is pretty conservative in the end. It is all about reaffirming the status quo, but we both quite enjoyed that film. Just because a film is uh, affirmative or conservative does not necessarily mean that it is bad. And I would like to argue that it would be possible for a film to be affirmative, to say that, you know, we as humans are okay, while also not being conservative and saying, but the status quo is perfect. Yeah, um, there but, are ways that you can do it. Yes, but this film, you're correct, Halloween is not one of them. Halloween, at the end of the day, is like, you know what's bad? People who don't do what they're supposed to do, namely teenagers, mm -hmm. right? Girls. Um, people who don't engage in the desirable 
activities, lifestyles, lifestyles that we should be engaging in if we're going to be quote moral upstanding people. And that's one of my big problems with it is that it is a highly affirmative and moralized film that does not acknowledge that it is highly affirmative and moralizing. I mean, Carpenter himself has talked about uh, when people because this is not an original critique that it that lives solely with me. This is something that many have pointed out about his film, but Carpenter has explained that this is not his intent. He's never was trying to make a moral statement. It's simply, uh, he views his characters as simply normal teenagers. And so when viewing it like that and seeing how Carpenter himself was ne wasn't, doesn't even view this like that, it becomes increasingly more difficult to overlook these highly moralized aspects of the film and how dismissive it is of other types of lifestyles and what by taking this affirmative approach and this highly moralistic way what it's saying no to and again i think for me it's not the affirmative nature that i have a problem with i don't mind it ending with this idea but but that you know but suburbia quick can be good or you know but the police can be figures that we can turn to in times of need. Um, I, I have no problems with that part. Where I do have a problem with, though, is, as you said, this more moralizing conservative framework. Because if you go through the film, right, and of course, um, Drew Goddard and Joss Whedon play with this idea in The Cabin in the Woods, right? You know who's going to die yep. based on whether or not they have done drugs, whether or not they have shirked their duties, whether mm -hmm. or not they have had sex, um, and whether or not they are good students, right? Like, you can kind of just cross... Whether or not they respect their parents or exactly. the adult figures of authority. Exactly. And, and likewise, in our character of Lori, we have... She's a good student. She dresses conservatively. Mm -hmm. She's not willing to do drugs. She's not having premarital sex. But she also is, quote, a good person in mm -hmm. that she is motherly, right? She's um, really good with kids. She's so very good. good with kids. And she's very good about, like, she takes her job seriously. And I think mm -hmm. it's important that it's not her watching her sister or her little brother. No. Right? Because then that would just be, like, about familial responsibility. She is actually a good example of what Americans value in good, hard workers. The girl next door. Yes. In every way possible. And then we likewise have, you know, at the end of the day, she doesn't entirely save herself because she's just so smart and so clever. No. She is aided by the strong male fatherly figure. Mm -hmm. That he comes in, guns a-blazing, after she has tried, but oh, woefully failed so many times to protect herself. Yeah. And it, is, and it is problematic, and I won't lie that, that there is something that we need to do with this. And I think it's examine it. I think it's acknowledge that it's problematic. And I think ask ourselves, why is that the case? So Hulu has this series called Into the Dark, which mm -hmm. are honestly really hit or miss. I mean, we're talking like drastically hit or miss. Um, but they have one called Pure that is so fundamentally disturbing because it's based on this idea that like father-daughter weekends and this religious christian religious group where the daughters pledge that they will remain pure mm. and they were made virginal and there's this line that says the two most important relationships a young girl has is with um god and with her father and then the fathers get keys to, uh, to protect their daughter's virginity oh it's, and there's like they're all in white like brides it's so gross and it's so disturbing and the, and the film ends with lilith um Sorry, I'm spoiling things, but this is important, right? The film ends with Lilith coming, and then the girls are like, no. Um, and then darkness and death and destruction, which you kind of get the moment you know that Lilith is going to be a part of this, right? Mm -hmm. But this is a film that I think is, is responding directly to films like Halloween. Yeah. To f and to the cultural, still existent idea that... Um, if women didn't want to have certain things happen to them, yeah. be that rape or being killed by Michael Myers, maybe they shouldn't have spilled on their outfit and then had to take all their clothes off while babysitting. Yeah, I would, it's this. There's a lot of like really kind of ha shots of half naked women. I was, while watching rewatching this film, I was like, God, what is this? movie have against partially naked women? Yeah, and and the truth is, is like, how dare you? intentionally or otherwise titillate us because if you mm -hmm. do that you should probably be punished for You're, that how dare you 
arouse the audience. Yeah. Now you've got to die. Yeah, pretty much. And so my question to you is, can we have a film that is worthwhile despite itself? Because this, I think, is, I like, I feel like this is, is a fundamental question of actually, like, the horror genre in general. But, like, can we say that Halloween deserves to be acknowledged despite all of its brokenness? Because if we say yes, it's possible that some of our other films that we say are really bad deserve to be acknowledged despite their darkness, too, right? So this is, like, depending on what you say to this, mm-hmm. will shape what your thoughts are, I think, on other films, too. But can we? So I would say... If my only problem with the film was this type of uh, issue with how it handled its female characters and just, like, this overall moralistic view, then perhaps. But my problems with this film do not only lie there. Okay. So what you're saying is, is that if it was just an issue of being a product of its time and a problematic product of its time you might be able to see past that. But then what then are your bigger problems? Because that really is, I think, my only major issue with this film. Well, I think that this film has major pacing issues as well as tonal issues. Okay. So let's start with what I think is a fantastic opening. I I also agree. I, I agree with you on this. And to me, I feel like the opening sets the tone for the pacing that's going to follow, that it is going to be slow, that it is going to be like, um, sort of like this driving into this conclusion that's only going to pick up speed right at the end. Like, I feel like the introduction for me sets that up. Is that not? So I think that the introduction is a brief, it gives, it was a brief glimmer of hope. I thought, cause I don't remember liking this movie before I rewatched it. I was like, Hmm. Halloween, it's not that good. I, It was fine or whatever. I understand, like, people really love it, but I just could never get behind it. I don't like it. This was like a brief glimmer of hope. I was like, oh, this is really interesting. I particularly really liked the opening credits of the film where it's slowly zooming in on that creepy jack-o'-lantern. Yes. And the, it made me very nostalgic for just, like, opening film credits. Yes, yeah. and for the acknowledgement that, like, music will truly make or break yeah. a horror film. And we hold on to that because the music and the use of non-diegetic sounds is going to be a pro, uh, a factor in why I think that the pacing and some of the tonal elements don't work. Okay. So keep that keep that in mind. Okay, I can do that. Um, One of the things I really liked about the beginning was the... I did enjoy the POV perspective. I knew you had a problem I, with the... I No, 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 no. I loved the, like, long voyeuristic take at the beginning of the film. Like, once not once we're past the opening credits, I'm talking about, like, actually when it's, like, moving and looking into the house. I really enjoyed that. I thought that that was really good. I, I made a note while watching it that the sex scene was the quickest sex ever. <laughs> it was under a minute. I mean, the first take lasted longer than that guy did. That's funny. That's horrible. But, you know, I I would imagine, like, that might be the experience of many teen couples, right? I mean, particularly in that time. Yeah, I guess. (laughs) Why that time? Like, do you think they had quicker sex in the 70s? Or just... Less care, less knowledge. Less okay, sex. okay, that makes sense. I thought you were just like <laughs> we have grown to as the years have passed. As sex years have passed, longer. sex has become longer. Yeah. Okay, I was just, I was just unsure <laughs> no, I mean, about just that. Like, like less emphasis on pleasing the women. Yeah, that yeah. Makes sense. Like, okay. <laughs> One of the things that I thought was interesting about the <laughs> the opening, besides that, but that is something that like every time I watch it, I'm always like, wow, that was because you have to figure like they had to take off their clothes. Too. Yeah, like and then get dressed. Yeah. Yeah, there's just a lot happening in a really short period of time. Um, I like, though, the fact that the point of view, the camera work is from the perspective of an adult human. Ad- well, under obviously human. An adult, probably male, because of where, like, where the camera is in relationship to, say, like, the light switches and mm-hmm. things like that. And so then when we realize it's a child at the end, there's this really sort of uncanny feel because we feel like it can't be a child or it is a child, but this child's just wrong. And so they're just the whole thing, including the just like funniness of the like fast sex. Just, Mm -hmm. I just worked for me. I agree that it worked for me until the eye filter of the mask 
came onto it. And then I was like, oh, your 70s is showing. They're like obsession with putting like filters over it and just like trying to create this thing from filters and swipes. And it's just like very of the time sure. with that. And I was like, well, this is kind of cheesy. It and is. it obscured a lot of it. And I was like, well. But see, I don't know. I <sighs> guess there's something about the like sort of unabashedness of this film that it's like, yep we did put a filter in or yep we did put a mask on you know like that just I think is one of its selling points that it is so unabashed in its like willingness to do things that may not stand the test of time and I was just like well this is cheesy and kind of silly now and it inevitably dates the film to the, the 70s when this was all the rage so I guess I'm not sure then that I completely understand what your issue is when you say you have an issue with the pacing. So you liked the introduction. I did. I did. Where is it that the pacing began to fail for you? So it's just that... So I don't have necessarily a problem with how slow the movie is. Being slow and not having a ton happen, that can be interesting. If the rest of the film is interesting and consistent and all of the elements are working together to keep this slow, lackadaisical type of feel throughout the rest of the film. But there's uses of non-diegetic sounds, not, and I'm not talking about the score, that interrupt the slow pacing of the film. Like um, Mike Myers, when he, there's this added sound effect over the score, his jump, it just sounds like, wee -oo! It sounds like a, a silly effect that just got added over the top, mm. and it takes you out of the movie, and you're like, what? And it ruins any of this slow kind of pacing, meticulous pacing, because they just so draw your attention to that and break you out of the movie and make you acknowledge that. And then you have to do work to get yourself back into the movie. So I don't remember the specific instance that you're talking about, but I'm thinking about other instances. So when, for example, like Lori looks out and he's there like amongst the, the drying sheets and then she looks again and he's not right. Like, and then there's sound and stuff happening mm -hmm. or when she looks across the street, right? Like, and, and there's always a sound that accompanies it. There's always non-diegetic elements to me that actually, I don't know, reminds me that like, I am scared that I should be disturbed by this and that like sometimes the scariest things are not um, someone st stabbing you or jumping out and attacking you. It's the fact that you're constantly on, on edge, that you're constantly feeling uneasy. And I just felt like all of the sounds and all of the sort of like moments where we see him and then we don't, we were building towards that. They were helping me to constantly be like, oh, okay, this is not right. This is not good. So, a film we're going to talk about, um, I think we're actually going to be releasing it next, is The Strangers. Um, and I think that this film, the, the Strangers, does what Halloween is doing, but better, because it removes those unnecessary diegetic sounds. Uh, the Strangers also has figures appearing in places, and then you blink, and, or you don't even blink, but you just are back now, and they're not there anymore. But there is no sound that draws you that your attention to that. It forces the audience to do the work, and so it doesn't break that movie and does not take you out of this. Whereas with Halloween, it's so heavy-handed and it's so just like, bam, look, viewer, yeah. look. So I would argue that that the difference is in terms of the, the affect, right? So that in The Strangers, we're afraid because we feel as though we're in this house trapped with them because we don't have the di non-diegetic score to, like, tell us we should be scared, right? Just like the characters don't hear someone be like, oh, I bet someone's broken into the house now. Like, we're <laughs> supposed to be afraid because we are them. But I would argue that in Halloween, the use of this, of this non-diegetic elements, the constant pulling us out of the narrative, reminds us that in this case, our role is to simply serve as the voyeur who can do nothing about it. All we can do is be afraid for the characters and afraid for the the version of home that we see being destroyed, but we're not part of that. Like, I think that's actually... You think it's intended to alienate. I don't know if it's intended to, but I think the fact that it does makes it become a really interesting way that we can experience horror so that we're not allowed to be part of their world. We're forced to be constantly an outsider, just like you're an outsider if you're not 
in if you don't live in a suburb, right? Like if you're a visitor or you are an outsider, I just felt like that that is the affect that is created, whether or not it's intended. And I I jive with that. I I, I, I gotta I just gotta disagree because I just think that it truly that the use of non diegetic sounds just breaks the tension rather than build it. And so it just never fully allowed me to get stay invested in this film because I was like, well, there's that silly sound effect that we we hear again. Because I love the score. I mean, it's Carpenter did a great it's job fantastic. with it. It's fantastic. There's a reason it's iconic. I will listen to the score when I think about spooky season. But not that like banana or whatever that little sound is that like when he appears. No. Okay. I will. Uh, I will not listen to that one. <laughs> So I think we're going to have to, on this, like, agree to disagree. And we'll just have to let people make up their own mind, yes. I suppose. So you can either be wrong. Oh. And, yeah. And, and, and be... think that these sound effects are good for the film. Oh, no. <laughs> I paused uh-huh. too long. <laughs> I took advantage of the pause. No. But, yeah, I think it really is, like, it, it really, truly isn't about right or wrong. It is, do you see this film as as gaining something by constantly pulling us out of, of the suspense? And, and that something would be that we feel alienated, we feel like we're forced to never be able to help the situation. Mm-hmm. Or do you feel like the, we lose something by having these elements because it denies us the opportunity to truly be invested in a way that would matter? And I think that depending on which way you fall is going to explain a lot about your preference in horror um, as well as uh, your thoughts about Halloween. Yeah. So another one of my issues that with this film is that all of the characters feel so like just fundamentally like they are from different properties like dr loomis feels like he's from this just intense place of good bad morality play just like there is no in between and it's um, it's so heightened it's almost comical just how like black or white everything with is with him then like the teenage girls uh feel like they're from this like sitcom like very just very much like Happy Daisy. And I will like, admit that one of my problems with the girls is that there's no way that these girls would be friends. Oh, absolutely not. Like, no, there's never. just no way. And not just that, like, they probably wouldn't want to hang out with Lori, but also Lori would not want to hang out with them. Like, it just doesn't make sense. No, because she is from a different thing. Right. She is the girl next door mixed with the nerdy, bookish girl who is just misunderstood. And then all of the children actors are just, they just. They're a classic example of children should not be allowed to act. Oh, that's I so I thought sad. that uh, one of the scariest parts of this film was, in fact, their performances. Oh, they can't help it. They were tiny and small. I don't know why I'm defending them since I usually don't defend you. Yeah, I was like, this I think is so because, oddly out of character I know, I think you. it's just because I feel, I feel like you're being so mean. What if they're listening as adults and they're like, that was my defining moment in life? I don't know. But, okay, so I'm going to agree with you in that they do feel nice. yeah but brace yourself they oh, do no. feel disconnected oh, no. from each other but i again whether or not that was intentional and i don't think it was i think this is an example of writing characters that are not real of, of not developing characters that are just going to be cannon fodder right like yeah but i think that there's something interesting that this film has these different themes that are represented by each character and so that the dr loomis michael myers narrative is a different narrative and explores different elements than the Laurie Michael Myers narrative. So let's go let's go down that road. So if that is the case and that's like a very intentional choice to make these characters not really mesh together and feel like they're not from the same world and have different plot lines do be about different themes. What that still adds up to is a film that feels off. There is a mishmash, and there. I think that goes into why the pacing feels so off for me, is because it just feels like I'm watching different things, and that have just been, like, clipped together. And so I'm not really invested in anything I'm seeing. I don't care if these characters die. I don't really... I'm not into watching this uh, Dr. Loomis run around and try to figure this out and be this savior i i just don't care about any of it and so you're right it does feel disconnected in that at no point is it like 
and Dr. Loomis, godfather of Lori, right? <laughs> like, but, but I don't think that's what this film needs because part of what makes this film disturbing is this randomness, is this idea that like we can have a monster that is a source of, of horror for different people depending on who you are, where you're at, and your thoughts about the, the subject. I, I agree. I don't know. I don't think it necessarily needs that either to feel like a, 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 a complete film. But to now go on to link this back to my overarching crit- critique, if they feel like it is just disgruntled and they are all just there to play two larger themes it becomes extremely hard to not just think about this film as a highly moralized film that is just like girls like this who are this way who are representing this type of people who drink smoke have sex before marriage deserve to die it becomes so very very hard to not think of it like that so i i will concede that you have a point but I just think at the end of the day that the problems you have with the film, ex- excluding the conservative message, right? Like the po- the problems that you have with the film are things that I actually see as being really intriguing, probably not intentional, but mm-hmm. very intriguing consequences of the film as it is. And so I don't have a problem with it because I see them as being things that make the film what it is for better and worse, but, but for better, um, <laughs> just... And so, yeah, I just, at the end of the day, I don't know if I can completely... And I, I, I'll i agree with you to a certain extent. I think there are a lot of elements within this film that are very interesting to study and to think about. I mean, there's reasons that this gets taught in classes. I mean, you've taught this film yes, before. I so, I mean, it definitely makes sense. There's a lot of really interesting elements at play. It's just for me. They didn't work. And so I think what I like about us talking about this film is this idea that, like, we oftentimes begin and end, not you and I, just people in general. And and I think we probably do this, too. We often begin and end our discussions with, like, I liked it or I didn't. Because mm-hmm. uh, that's a really easy place to go, and that's a place that, like, is just a nice place to I go. I mean, and on in this day of, like, uh, just extremist opinions yes. and everything, it's very hard to have, like, a nuanced opinion about anything, because particularly on the Internet... With an, you either want to like or a dislike. Right, and and there's no, like, room for comment. But I I think what's important is not did you like or did you not like a film, but does the film, does engender enough conversation that makes it so that you can have this sort of, like, heated debate? Mm -hmm. And I think some of the films that we've had major problems with, we've had problems with in part because we don't feel like it, it allows for much conversation. And I think that this film, whether or not you are saddened by it or (laughs) delighted by it, ensures that you're going to keep talking about it. And that, to me, is the sign of at least an interesting film, if not a a good film. We're doing something kind of different with this Halloween episode in that every so often we wanted to have a a sort of outlier episode independent of our regular every couple weeks. Um, Because we wanted to do, and by we, really, I really wanted to, (laughs) and I was like, Anthony, please, this is so important to me, also talk about horror fiction. And, I mean, not that the films we've been watching aren't also horror fiction. Sure. But what you were literary talking, fiction. Literary Thank fiction. You so much. I yes. was like, wow, I hope people don't think we think that what's happening in these horror films is nonfiction. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I had Googled something the other day and it came and one of the questions that like people been asking because it popped up was, is Stephen King's it based on true events? And I was like, oh gosh. There's Boy. some yeah. So no, horror fiction it's all been but specifically horror literary fiction. But we understand that it's a much easier to, when we tell you two weeks on, in advance, like this is the next film we're going to watch and talk about for you to be able to watch it. Um, there's not that same easy time turnaround for you to be able to read a novel. So we are going to give you some time to hopefully read a novel for our next special episode, which is going to be on The House Next Door by Anne River Siddons. So this book was much like Halloween, also released in 1978. All of our special episodes must come from the year 1978 now. No, because the next (laughs) thing I want to talk about most definitely is not 1978. But there is a nice symmetry. The reason, though, is that this is an interesting book because it doesn't get talked a lot about in discussions of horror because Anne River Siddons wasn't actually a horror writer. a horror writer. No, but this is a 
fantastic book. It's going to continue with many of our discussions for the idea of the suburban dream and all mm-hmm. that stuff. So b- between now and January 1st, when our episode will release, we encourage you to please read uh, The House Next Door, again, by Ann Rivers Siddons, and join us for that special episode uh, on January 1st. And thank you once again for tuning in to our very special the spooky, scary Halloween episode. <laughs> As always, like us and such. Share us with your friends. Thank you for listening. <laughs>